not to accept it but live with it. It was like living with an elephant. His room was tiny and every morning he had to squeeze around the truth just to get to the bathroom. To reach the armoire he had to get a pair of, a pair of pants. He had to crawl under the truth. Playing, it, would, it, wouldn't choose to, it wouldn't choose that moment to sit on his face. At night when he closed his eyes, he felt it looming above him. The elephant in the room. It's become used for, for different things in religion, in race relations, in the size of a person, in historical inaccuracies, in false news, in slavery, in work situations. Many times the, the elephant in the room was referred to that for maternity leave. In the Me Too movement, in addictions for kids with parents of addictions. It's been used in politics, in patriarchy, in climate changes, even the loss of fossil fuels. Time Magazine even called the elephant in the room Governor Chris Christie. But it means a lot of different things. Ultimately, it leads to somebody, something that somebody just doesn't want to talk about. So I thought we'd look at this today, and, and if we get to it next week, we will, but I'm hoping to wrap this up today. But as I consider the great honor you bestowed upon LaDonna and myself beginning our 25th anniversary here at Grace, and it was wonderful, we loved it, the love offering, the gifts, the calls, the cards we had, we are still enjoying it. But then two weeks later, after our 25th anniversary launch service, the 1st of August, you had another time you sang happy birthday to me. And the prime timers who celebrate everybody's birthday, everybody in August got to honor us again. And they pointed out that I had turned a magical age. But we at least got to go through the lunch line early that day. It was wonderful. There was a month of celebration that couldn't have been more special to the plumps. We even had the family over. We had 32 members of our family, LaDonna's family, because we had 10 people celebrating a birthday in the month of August and September. We had people everywhere, in the backyard, and all the tables, and it was wonderful. It was a wonderful celebration of our birthdays. A great party. Todd even came up from, from Austin, and he cooked our steaks. And, but once again, we were confronted with an elephant in the room. I had to officially acknowledge that I'm an old person. 65 years old. Wow. No, it's nothing to celebrate. Not that an age makes you old, but it's a gauge. Because a number doesn't make you old. But I had to see it. I had to grasp it. I had to come to deal with it. There are many elephants in our rooms that we all know are there and nobody wants to talk about them. But they happen in our lives and they happen in our world and they happen in our church. Last week up till 7.30 in the morning I was supposed to go to another church and intervene in that church because there were some rumors and charges being, being presented to their presbyter. And so I was the executive that was elected to go out and take care of the problem. So Jamie had already asked him early in the week to preach and he was ready to go and I felt bad because Brianna and Dustin were out of town and Terry did a marvelous job helping out that week and he was going to come in Jamie was going to lead worship then turn around and preach and and then about 7.30, we did some more praying and thinking, and we ended up not going. But we went later with the presbyter this week, and I walked into the room, and the whole congregation was there. I was expecting it to be a small little meeting with just the board and the pastor and a couple of people with all these allegations, and come to find out the whole church was there. And the pastor said, well, I want to know everybody what was going on. They all knew there were rumors and there was an elephant in the room, so I wanted to come talk about it. So we had a meeting, worked well, went wonderful, all cleared up, the rumors were gone, I handled it, the symbols of God, and the, and, the, and the kingdom of God goes on, and we had to address the elephant in the room. Hmm. Sometimes it happens around grace. We had a staff person one time that decided to leave. And I had one of the members of the church come and said, did you fire that young man? I said, I did not. He chose to leave and he left. But that was an elephant in the room. Recently, some of you have asked us about the smaller attendance in our grace in Espanol. It was an elephant in the room. So I wanted to address it before we get into what my biblical message is today. 
We originally started in Spanish with a marriage seminar. James and Maritza had invested into their, their people, their people that worked with them, their friends, and we were starting a small marriage seminar, and it took off. It was a great success with over 45 people at its, at its peak. And then we felt like there was a need for ministering to Spanish-speaking people at Grace, which has always been my heart. Y'all know that. I went to Costa Rica so I could learn to preach in Spanish. Never happened, but I got better anyway. So we invited Francisco and Viviana to come and be with us and start leading services in Spanish and had great attendance and even had the big, we saw a miracle. I don't know if you know that. We saw a miracle because we didn't have food but for 100 people and we fed 189 people out front. Now they probably got three pieces of rice per person, but it, it reached, it made it, made the journey. And then there were some differences of opinion about some of the issues both inside the church and outside the church. So some have chosen not to continue to come to church here and with grace in Espanol. And I have to understand that and realize that some people, not everybody's wise enough to go to our church. <laughs> so our grace in Espanol is running through a lower season right now, but we're in the rebuilding mode and they're growing every week. I think they had close to 30 last week. They, they, in, the, in the high days, they only had 70 or 80 in the adults. And I will be the first to defend Pastor Francisco and Viviana and their work. And I'm not going to let anybody in this church come against them and what they're trying to do. Amen. This is a growing area of our community. We've got a lot of people and I appreciate Maritza and James. Nobody's brought more Spanish speaking people to our church than they have through the years. Amen. So we appreciate what they've done. But that's part of our community. We've got to realize it. They're here. Um, I say they, people that speak Spanish, because I wish I was one of them, but I'm not. So I wish I could pick it up. James has picked it up so well and doing good. But to come against the ministry of grace is be like somebody going to the nursery and saying, you don't want to take your kids to the nursery. They have dirty diapers down there. <laughs> and they do. Trust me, they do. But I will not have anybody coming against the ministry in our church. So if you've got questions, come see me. But there are other elephants in the room and in the church. The elephant in the room that we may not want to talk about is inevitable. It's a process. It's called aging and dying. Now, I didn't want to talk about this, but this is what has hit me lately, okay? I told you several weeks ago I was going to talk about that after I turned 65 and realized... I reached a magical age. So let's talk about elephant number one, aging and death. We may not want to talk about it, but we're all getting older. Do you know what happens to you when you stop getting older? You die. It's really cute when our kids get older and they grow up. We remark about how time goes past and how they've grown up. And, and my, even my Brody is now walking, our younger grandson. We didn't realize how tough it was to raise two kids until August 1st when Haley let Brody come stay with us. And our weekend visits are a whole nother fiasco now. Riley's four. He can pretty much take care of himself. We just let him lock up and go home when he wants to. He had his routine. But Brody comes along and Brody's all over the house. Into everything because he's, he's now crawling marvelously but he also scoots everywhere. And he crawls, and so it's a different, and, and we're, 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 we love to see the pictures. And we see the pictures of our kids, and we say, oh, how they've grown up, until they show us in the pictures, and we're going, oh, my land, what happened to me? <laughs> the cuteness of our children growing up and adding years, it's not so cute, though, when we find out that we have aches and pains that go along with this growing up. And we see wrinkles we didn't used to see. We find ourselves hurting after doing stuff like great activities like gardening and snow skiing and basketball or golf or shopping or even running in the mud. And we start hurting. Somebody once said growing old is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> Come on, you've never heard that? Well, in our house, the toilet paper goes faster towards the end of the roll. 
Even the Bible tells us this fact. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. And it was appointed unto men once to die, but after this a judgment. Do you realize that the Bible tells us we're going to die? The Dallas Morning News ran a massive article this week about the passing of a great man, T. Boone Pickens. But in the midst of that article, they also talked about three other guys. They, they talked about Herb Kelleher, who passed away, made an impact with his life. And the other was Ross Perot. Three guys who had made an impact in their lives, but all of them have died this year. And our, probably our country will be different because of it. At his death, T. Boone Pickens was only worth $500 million. You can feel sorry for him. But don't feel very sorry for him because he had given away over a billion dollars in the last two years to charities. It's amazing when you go back and read the life of T. Boone Pickens. He lost his whole company at 68 years old. He was voted out of office and they took his company away from him. So what did he do? He said, I'm going to start over in the fourth quarter. So he went and built another big company, made another billion dollars and gave it away again. Even in his old age, we can make things happen. It also talked about he had five wives. Now, I'm not going to say you have, he lived up into his 90s. Some he outlived, some he did away with. And <laughs> I don't mean that way, he divorced them. <laughs> I guess you got to be tick, you got to be careful when you talk about dying and then you say he did away with somebody. But towards the end of his life, he ended up going back to wife number three, and they were back into a relationship. The elephant in the room is that we are like vapors. We're here today and we're gone tomorrow. The scripture tells us this in James chapter 4, verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. For what you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, and if we do this or do that. The New International Version says your life is a mist. I preached a funeral the other day for a friend of mine's, a close friend of mine's mother. She was 89 years old and she was ready to meet God. But we all too will do the same thing. We'll face death someday. It's final. And for her it was welcomed. She had dementia, couldn't move around. She had been in a nursing home. She had been in a hospital. She was ready to go. And her husband told me, he said, he said, I hate to, they've been married 72 years. He stole her right out of high school. And he said, if the Lord chooses to take her home, I'll just have to accept it. If he heals her, I'll just have to accept it. We're just going to have to trust in the Lord. Hmm. But also it was my lot in life to go give death notification for a young man that was killed in a car wreck in my neighborhood at 30 years old. I was talking to the officer this morning. She was there, the investigator, that night, Sunday night after the big party at our house. I had to go grieve to give the notice to this young family. They, it wasn't as welcoming in death for them as it was for the other family. I don't mind preaching funerals because everybody's listening. Everybody's paying attention. And I usually ask at every funeral that I preach, are you ready to meet death? And I ask them, how are you using your life? Because it's kind of like an elephant in the room. Nobody wants the preacher comes up and say, are you ready to meet God? Are you ready to die? Do you have everything ready? Nobody wants to talk about that, but it's like a big elephant in the room. At some point, you've got to address it. It's kind of like this big inevitable thing that's right there in front of you. And if you don't talk about it, you're going to find it's going to catch up with you. And you're going to have to deal with it whether you're ready or not. But a funeral will give me a memorial service. It will give me the opportunity to ask somebody point blank, are you ready to meet God? And let me help you pray with that. Matter of fact, the other day we were at this funeral and probably four family members came to me and says, you be sure to give an altar call. You be sure to give an altar call because that's what she'd want. And then the people that did spoke, the Baptist pastor that went first, he gave an altar call. One of the daughters gave an altar call. I gave an altar call. Because that was what Ruth Pascal wanted, everybody to know Jesus, even at her funeral. The one big elephant in the room is that we're all going to die and we're going to face judgment. Scripture says so. I know you don't want to talk about it, but you must. We have to, we've had to talk about my death around here for a long time. 
When we first borrowed the first million dollars to build this first little building here, the bank made me go get a million dollar key man life insurance policy. So even in 1997, we had to buy a million dollar policy and I had to address the fact that I might die. I was just thrilled that the bank thought we had a key man around here. <laughs> but I want to ask you some basic questions this morning as we deal with this first elephant in the room. Do you have insurance? Do you have enough? Pastor, <laughs> there's a commercial on TV now where the, where the lady says, we need to talk about, no, 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 we're not going to talk about insurance. Yes, we need to talk about, no, 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 no. You've heard it right on the radio? No, 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 I'm not going to talk about it. She says, well, you must not love me. And he said, well, I, I do love you. Well, you need to talk about insurance. We need to talk about it. Folks, I want you to hear this morning that you need to address the elephant in the room that there may come a time where you need some insurance because you may not be here tomorrow. I had a board member in my church in Lighthouse, Fort Worth. His name was Walter. Good, good, great guy. And I said, Walter, have you got enough insurance? Oh, I don't need insurance. I've got plenty of insurance on me. I've got like $3 million. She'll be fine. I said, what happens if you lose Tammy? Well, she doesn't make any money. I said, now, Walter, you think about that. Who's going to take care of the house, the kids, run them to school, make the clothes? Who's, who's going to take care? You need to think about what she cost to be your wife or what she contributes. I never thought about that. I just didn't think about that. What about the loss of the Social Security? I know some of you are dealing with that. That comes along with the loss of a spouse. Some of you understand this. Do you have a will? Have you arranged for your funeral? Hmm. Your kids need to be seen to after you're gone. We must discover that some have not done enough to ensure their wishes are carried out. My dad with a will. He had a will when he passed away. He even named an executor. He just forgot to tell the executor what to do. So we got there and, we, and everybody says, well, your mother gets everything. Out. No, no, no. In the state of Texas. Now, this is not legal advice. But when you pass away in the state of Texas, if you're, everything goes to your, your, half of it goes to your wife. The other half is divided between your wife and all your kids. So we had to go file a claim and turn all the, all the funds back to my mother and redeed the property back. There's a whole deal. You don't just assume anything. You make sure you've got it right. I'm talking about the elephant in the room that you've got to deal with the things that may happen when you die because ultimately you're going to pass away. The Bible says so. Reality says so. You need to look into it. Your funeral arrangements, don't place that all on, on your parents. I mean, on your kids or your parents. Express your thoughts. Don't make it too difficult on your kids with some outlandish dreams. Sister Tipton, whose nephew is in the house this morning, used to want the Garland High School band to lead the hearse down Garland Road. And we're thinking, yeah, right. But that was, and she was teasing, and we assumed she was teasing because it didn't happen. She also wanted a dozen motorcycle cops leading her down the way. And you don't want to go too cheap either. Leave your kids some room to, to honor you. You know, most people don't think about it. In, in a funeral situation, you all do three things. You want to honor God, glorify God, honor the person that deceased, and comfort the family. So leave some, some flexibility there. Don't you just love these Feel good sermons. <laughs> I'm talking about the elephant in the room. There's, there's, there, you need to think about this, okay? You talk about a will. Do you realize that if you're in the state of Texas and you have a minor child and you do not have a will and you live here with a minor child, if you pass away and there's not a will telling where the kids go, they become wards of the state of Texas. You can't send them to Oklahoma to mom and dad. You can't send them to Timbuktu. They become wards of the state of Texas. You need to get your wills in place. Have you thought about your retirement? You young couples in the church, you need to think about it when you're in your 30s and 40s and 50s and 20s. I'm so thankful Pastor Tipton made us go back and put $100 a month 
into a retirement years and years ago. Instead of a raise one year, I put $100 a month into a retirement program. I'm thankful to the Grace Board that matches our staff. When they put back something for retirement, they'll match up to a certain percentage. Because when you get close to 65, everybody calls you and writes. That is the most frequent letter I get these days. Everybody wants to tell me how to retire and invest my money and, and buy me insurance and have a supplement for my insurance. And you want to pull your hair out. Or your Medicare or your supplement or something. The trouble is for most of us, by the time we get to 65, it's too late. Now, I'm not publicly endorsing anybody in the church, but there are some people in the church that can help you with your retirement program. And they would help their pastor if I could find the file that's in the garage from when we moved. <laughs> I'm just talking about the elephant in the room. Don't, inv don't ignore that elephant. This elephant is large, it's gray, and it must be dealt with. We're getting older every day. Somebody, someday we will all face death. We will all face aging. But we should also not let the elephant drive us to consider how we're living our lives. I think we need to realize that someday the fact that you are going to pass away should address how you live your life. One of my favorite quotes at a funeral is, the best use of your life is to use your life so that the use of your life will outlive your life. Scripture tells us in Revelation that so those that die in the Lord, their works will follow after them. Are you addressing what happens to you and your works after you're gone? Because you're going to die. You've also got to use your life right up to the very end. What are you doing with your life? In light of this big elephant, are you investing in others? Your kids, your grandkids, are you investing in the kingdom of God, in missions? Or can you imagine T. Boone Pickens leaving billions of dollars left for somebody to fight over? I heard about that fact just this week. Somebody was telling us about their, their kids got into a big squabble. I don't remember who it was, but the family got into a big squabble after, over the uh, affairs. Just let everybody know what you're going to do. I know you think you don't have a lot, but remember, you probably have a whole lot more than you think you do. If you live in Flower Mound and own a home because of the inflation and because of your equity, you got much more money than you think you do. Deal with the elephant in the room. Now, there's, a, there's one A that I put in here. You've got to invest in the next generation. Because of, because of elephant number one, that you're dying and you're getting older, you need to invest in the next generation. One of my goals and one of my great visions is to make the next generations in families that are younger than mine have an investment into them. Joshua chapter 4 verse 20 said, Joshua set up in Gilgal 12 stones he took out of the Jordan. And he said to the Israelites, in the future... When your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on the dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before until, the, until you had all crossed over. And the Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea. He did this so that the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. And so that you might always fear the Lord your God. And he told them to invest it in the next generation. Teach your children. Now this means our students, our children, our nursery, our families. I'm so proud of our families that, that come to church and are faith. And some go to great lengths to get here. I saw a family today get out of their little minivan with their little daughter and their twin boys. And they came to church. And I know they drove probably 30 minutes to get to church. I appreciate that. They're investing in the next generation. We owe that next generation very much. It means we've got to be involved in the next generation. By teaching, by giving of our time, by investing them. We, I was just talking to somebody this week about, uh, the, uh, about one of the weaknesses of aging. And they said, we think we did our part. When we were 30 and 40, we invested in the church and we taught Sunday school and we did this and we did that. And we've done our part. I don't have to do it anymore. That's wrong. The elephant in the room is you need to invest in that next generation. Joshua told, was told what, to the people to do. The Lord told him put up with some stones so you can teach the next generation. Some of you still have much to give. Some of you can still get involved and, and work and do something for the kingdom of God. Don't just because you got to a certain age think you've got to stop. 
We have an obligation to prepare grace for the next generation. To teach and train and pour our lives and work into the next 40 years. I realize I won't be here in 40 years. And many of you won't be here, but we need to invest in that church. I appreciate Liz telling me about the church in Oklahoma. It's now 100 years old, and she said they've had five pastors. That's a legacy. We need to realize there's an elephant of aging that draws us to new commitments, to be involved, to love on our families, to help in the nursery, help in kids' church. Sponsoring a kid to go into camp is great, but do you ever think about going to camp with them? Boy, that was, that was like a blast of cold air coming back up this way. That's very true. I appreciate some of these guys that take a week of vacation and go pour their lives into young people. I appreciate Terry North. He's old. <laughs> Only because he said, but Terry at 70 took a week of his retirement and spent in sports camp out there on the field with the kids in baseball. I appreciate that. I like that. Some of you others, you're up here working snacks and doing the, you know, I, I think it's great. I, I discovered the other day, you need to be involved in missions. That next generation needs you. I can look at my missionary career of, of all my missions work. And when my first we went down to Honduras and then we went to El Salvador and I laid block and laid block, and laid block, and laid block. And I got so tired of laying Haydite block, but we built churches. And then I went to Durban, South Africa, and we helped build a Bible college. We toured, went with Frank Wilson. We had a bunch of you guys went with us. And we laid block. And then I got to go teach in the, in the, in the school in Mongolia. Then I got to teach a graduate program. And now finally my last missions program, and the next one I'm going on, if I get to go, I'm going to work in the nursery with two-year-olds. I can see I went from laying block to teaching graduate school to nursery. But I also realize I'm investing in the next generation. I'm giving myself. Some of you, I'm speaking to you today. The, in, the elephant in the room is that you're getting older and you know good and well you need to be investing yourself in the kingdom of God. You need to be doing something for the church. Something more than just coming and eating donuts and going home. Boy, this is, just, this is just one of those messages that just, you'll have to come clean this up, Jamie. <laughs> Didn't he do a great job last week? Yeah. Had an incredible message. Really good. It was in my notes. I just forgot to mention it. It really was tipped up there. I was asked last week at a dinner party, how long are you going to continue to pastor? And all of a sudden we had an elephant come walking in the room. But it stays in every room I walk into. They look at me and say, oh man, he's old. I can't retire just yet. Because my wife has promised me I can't retire until I know what I'm going to do next. We were with some friends last night. They're about our same age. And uh, he said, uh, his wife said, said he's going to retire when I retire in two years. She was 63. She said, when I turn 65, he's going to retire. He said, I may not make it that long. <laughs> but they've got a plan. They've got a plan of what they're going to do, where they're going to do it, how they're investing. Hmm. I, I tell you what, I, I'm praying, and I know you will pray, that God will let me know what it's time. I'm listening for God's war. God called us to Flower Mountain, Texas. I can take you to the spot. I can take you where God broke my heart and said, this is where you need to pour your life. Now we're working on our 25th year. I'm 65 years old. And I'm praying, God, okay. I'm still listening for you. And nobody can know that. Not me, not LaDonna, not anybody else can know that until God says it's time. So we must acknowledge that there's an elephant in the room. We see it. it may be part of our discussion, but it's not going to be something we fear or dread. And because we're a multi-generational church, we've got to focus on all of our generations. We've got a lot of new babies in the nursery. We've got kids in the nursery. That means we need you involved in children's church, in Sunday school, in the nursery, in sports camp, in youth ministry. We need you involved. We've got a lot of different age groups. We have, we have, we're slightly heavy in one generation right here. 
the, the one that's just a little bit older than I am. And we appreciate them and we love on them and we're going to do everything we can to support them. But I'm talking to you guys also this morning. You may be past 65. You may be really old. You're older than me. You're like dirt. <laughs> but you need to be involved in ministry. You need to be doing something. I appreciate George Rosner. He's right there in front of me somewhere. Oh, back over there. George goes out on Friday afternoon and witnesses down at the mall. And he tells people about Jesus Christ. And he's, he's much older than I am. <laughs> you know when we knew George got old, he cut off his ponytail. <laughs> but that's, that's an incredible man that gets involved. It's kind of like, like the scripture where, where, where the Caleb says, give me that mountain. It came from a burning heart inside of him that he wanted to do something. Sure he was old and sure he was ready to go do something. But you need to be out there doing something for the kingdom. So this morning, and I'm out of time, I've got to, I'll, let me tell you the next one. And we'll get to it next week. Number two is uh, the elephant suicide happens in the church. I didn't want to preach on suicide, but this week, an associate pastor of a very large church in California took his life. And he was very openly on Facebook. And, and he, he was director of the group about hope. And, he, and he, had, he talked about his depression. And it came up often. And he addressed it. But he took his life. So we're going to talk about that next week. Because it affected our family, Donna's family, and my family this week. And it's something that's heavy on my heart. But it's an elephant in the room we've got to deal with. So I'm going to wrap up. I'm, I've got six minutes. And I want to finish real quickly. The elephant in the room today is the fact that we're getting older and we're going to die. And I'm going to challenge you. Are you thinking about it? Are you planning? No, but don't, you got to plan on, you got to plan for your death. You don't plan on dying. It's going to happen. You plan for your death. And I pray every one of you writes letters to your kids. I pray every one of you gets on your will, buys some insurance, takes care of the situation. But because we're a multi-generational church, the Lord kind of spoke to me about something I want to do today as we close. So let's pray. Father, thank you for several things that are realities in our life. They may be elephants in the room, but Lord, but they're really just reality. And Father, every one of us must realize that we're heading in a direction. We don't get to recycle and come back as something else. We're heading in a direction to where we're dying and we're going to meet you. So we need to use our life so that the way we use our life will outlive our life. And Father, in our church are many generations. And I pray we will do everything in our power to continue that grace continues for years and years to come. I pray you direct our lives, direct our steps, direct our thoughts. And Father, I pray that you would challenge some of us that may be past 50, past 40, that we're not doing everything we can for the kingdom to get involved. And I pray this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now this was more of a pastoral message. So if you're a guest today, I invite you to come back when, when Jamie preaches and you hear something more encouraging. Or come back next week when pastor preaches on suicide. But I want everybody to stand with me. We're going to do something this morning just a little different. If you're in the house and you're under 30 years old, I want you to come down quickly and come stand right up against the front. Under 30. I see some of you trying to slip out like you, 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 can, you can face either way, under 30. Now that's, that's moms and dads and people and good morning. Everybody's under 30. Well, but now we got a lot of folks next door and things like that. So come on in and come close. Come up close to the platform because everybody's going to come in behind you. Okay, now you're, are y'all not under 30? You're welcome to come join us. I want you to be part of it. Bring big sister. Okay, now if you're up to 50 years old, this is going to be the Christmas bag in, in reverse. If you're up to 50 years old, I want you to come right in behind him. If you're up to 50 years old, I want you to come right in behind him. I want you to get up close to him. We're a multi-generational church. Come up close. Get up close because I want everybody to get close. Okay, now if you're up to 65, you're old, not as old as I am, but you're up to 65, you come and get right up behind these guys. Y'all keep coming up close. Come up close. We're going to have prayer today. 
And I want the prayers of the older folks in our house to just cover, cover the house this morning. Look at all these young people. Now this will make you sick. Everybody in the front of this church is younger than I am. Okay. Yeah, can y'all scoot around there? I want some more people come in. Look at all these youngsters. Much younger than I am. Yeah, come on, come on around, spread on out there. David, move to your left. David, there you go. Keep get, get room for people to come in behind you. Okay, now you guys in the back, you're our backbone. You're my age. You're good folks. I appreciate you. I love you. But I need you to pray. So y'all come, y'all come get behind all these young 65 and youngers. I noticed my wife got in the younger crowd this morning. She's got a whole month left. Y'all come on, all you prayer warriors, y'all come and get close. And, and I want us to pray one for the other. So everybody reach your hand out and touch the person in front of you. If you're older, you pray for the younger person. If you're, if you're older than them, you pray for the next younger person. We're just going to let prayer just kind of cascade across our building this morning. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we've come today and we've talked about an issue that's very important to us. The very fact that we have many generations in our church and we're all heading in a direction. According to Scripture, we have a mist, we have a vapor, and we've got to use it for all we can. So Lord, I pray that the anointing of God will be upon us as we get involved with them. Ministry to that next generation younger, that next level younger than us, Father. I pray the power of God would go into them. I pray that you'd minister to them. I pray that you'd encourage them. May you hit them with the fire of the Holy Ghost, Lord, to where they'll go be boldly challenged to go do something great for the kingdom of God. Lord, I pray for all these young people, these students and these younger families. I I pray you'd bless them and help them. I pray for all these, Lord, oh God, that are maybe a little older, and I pray you'd challenge them to, to work on insurance and work on wills and work on getting ready to use their life. And I pray for those in the back, Lord, that are in that next generation. I pray that you'd bless them, give them life, give them health, give them encouragement, give them strength, oh Father, and may their prayers just continue to come forward and touch the next generation. Lord, I pray for all of our young people that you'd bless them and anoint them and encourage them, Father. Father. Father, may we become a great church that lasts a hundred years like the great Woodlake Church in Tulsa. Lord, anoint our people. Anoint our leadership, Lord. Anoint our young people, Father. I pray that you'll challenge every one of us to get involved in ministry. In ministry in the kingdom of God. Bless, O oh Lord, every generation of our church in the powerful name of Christ our Master. Lord, we bless your name. We bless your name. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity we have to, to be involved in ministry to the kingdom of God. Lord, help us do everything we can to pass on our, our faith, our encouragement, our, our love for you, our service to that next generation that's just beyond us, Father. Help them, encourage them, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we praise you, Father. Amen. Now, if you're past 65, I want you to raise your right hand. Past 65, Amy Hansen. And I want you to repeat after me. Say, I promise to do everything I can to invest in the next generation to make sure you have a great church, a great witness, a great place to worship, to build the kingdom of God. And I promise I'm going to get involved, give you my best to the kingdom of the Lord. Now, if you're under 65, you raise your left hand. No, you're young. You can raise both hands. <laughs> Say, I promise, I promise to you, O Lord, Lord, I'm going to do my very best Lord, to support my elders, Lord, to help them, Lord, to pray for them, Lord, to encourage them. Because I know this Lord, is a great church. A great church. And I'm going to do my best Lord, to keep it going for years to come. For, for the kingdom of God. Lord, In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Well, may God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he smile over you. And I pray that the peace of God would be upon every one of you in the house. Get the chance to meet Jeju and his lovely wife right, right there and, and love on them and encourage them as they're going out into mission. So, In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.